All right. Well, this uh, Friday, September 22nd, is the, the lunch for the Amarillo Police Department Benefit uh, Fund. And so we've been talking about this. And uh, we have tickets that are at the information desk. We've not sold many tickets. So I really want to encourage you this morning to be sure and buy some tickets. And this is for a very, very good cause. It's uh, at the Civic Center Grand Plaza and um, hamburger feast and they'll also have hot dogs and sausage wraps, big old German sausage in a tortilla and chips and soft drinks and you can just have anything you want for a, a $7 donation and it all goes to help this benefit fund so it's for a very very good cause and so I want to ask uh, Heather if she'd come and just share a little bit about that fund Good morning. Um, our benefit fund, of course, is set up through the police department. It's a nonprofit thing. We get donations. We have this fundraiser every year, but it's a big deal. And for anyone that's been struck by tragedy or something's come up in their family or whatever, that fund is what helps the officers. And sometimes they use it to help some of our civilian employees. Um, but as y'all, a lot of y'all know, Justin Sherlin was my brother-in-law. So. I personally saw how that helped my own family. Um, in 2011, I was a victim of a house fire and that fund helped me. I lost everything in one day. And so they put that fund on and that's there to help officers in time of need, tragedy, emergency. And you know, I've sat on the board for that fund before, so it's a big deal. And the big thing is, is what we wanna do is we wanna get to know our community better. And a lot of times police officers, we go out to your house because someone's burglarized or whatever and it is the worst day for y'all. And we deal with that every day, but we don't get the time to see you on a good day, basically. It's a bad day for y'all. And so this is a good time for y'all to come out, sit down, eat with us, visit with us. There'll be a lot of us there in uniform. And so we wanna, we wanna get the community more involved with us. And so y'all can see, hey, we're just normal people. And I know all y'all know me here. So um, y'all are used to me, but there's a lot of officers that are serving in our community. They're good people. Um, they have families. And so I want to invite y'all to come out, eat. It's, I mean, inexpensive, $7, and it's going to be a good time. Um, one other thing I wanted to add is we want volunteers to go up there from the church. And um, there are other churches involved, but not everyone sends volunteers. And for me personally, I love my church. And I love that there's people here in our church family that's willing to go up there. And it's just a couple hours of your time. So um, if you want to volunteer, sign up. I think I, I counted. I've been counting every Sunday. We got eight people back there. I know we can get more than eight people to go up there and um, help serve hot dogs or talk to people or greet or whatever and represent our church. And that's a big deal because not all of our officers have a church home. And if we could get more of them going here, I sure would love that. So, Amen. Anyways, and buy a ticket and give them out or something, you know. And um, that's all I have to say. Thanks. All right. Great job. <laughs> Heather's very persuasive. I don't know if it's the gun or what, but uh, <laughs> she got my attention. So, Even if you cannot go for some reason, buy some tickets. This is a this is, uh, benefit, see. And so it's going to go to a good cause and hand them out to somebody. Say, here, I bought you a lunch. And you can go anytime between 11 and 1 and uh, just take your time and have lunch. You can take it with you if you want to. They're going to have to go boxes. Last year, our group helped make deliveries to some of the schools. In fact, our church is going to sponsor a school this year and take lunch for all the teachers that want one, a free lunch. And all that money goes for a good cause. So the tickets are at the information desk. Hope you'll pick up some of those before you leave this morning and hand those out or come yourself and help with a very, very good cause. We can't do enough to show our appreciation to our Amarillo Police Department. So, hope you'll help with that. Okay, well today we're in Mark chapter 10 again. Mark chapter 10. And today we have a message about Jesus uh, and his interaction with some children. And you all almost jumped over this section of Scripture. As we're moving through this, I looked at it and I thought, well, maybe I'll just move on to the next section. I thought, no, I need to take a, a much better look at this. And uh, you read through it at first glance, you think, well, it just gives us an account of something that happened with Jesus and may not see a great deal of significance uh, in it. 
But the more I looked at it and prayed about it, I could see that this is very, very important and certainly something that the Lord wants us to understand and appreciate this matter of children and how important children are. Uh, in Psalm 127, the psalmist writes about the importance of children and, uh, and how much they bless our lives. Uh, in verses 3 through 5, he says, Children are a gift from the Lord. They are, are a reward from Him. Children born to a young man are like sharp arrows in a warrior's hands. How happy is the man whose quiver is full of them. And so I, I read that. I thought, what does that mean? You know, a young man having children and it's like sharp arrows in his hand, a warrior. And I thought, what's the connection there with children? I thought, well, you know, I think to me what that means is that children, having children as a father, it inspires you to want to succeed. It inspires you to want to do for them, to protect them, and to go out in, against the world and to fight against evil. And so that makes sense to me that having children, you know, it, it just encourages you to want to do better for your children, you know, make, make the world a better place and to, to reach out in this world and to help other children as well, but to fight against evil. So I think that's what that means. And I was told years ago that a quiver will hold about five arrows, so everybody ought to have at least five children. So if you don't have five kids and you're in that time of your life, you need to work on that and and uh, that would help the church grow as well. So, anyway. What's that? That goes for me. Well, okay. I think that's gone for me. But uh, I guess you could always adopt. I don't even want to talk about that, though. So, okay. See, now you got me under conviction. So. Anyway, children are so important. And they are a tremendous blessing, aren't they? And then I, I found this passage. This is uh, very meaningful to me. Proverbs 17, 6. Grandchildren are the crowning glory of the aged. Amen? Man, there's just something special about grandkids. I mean, kids are great, but grandkids are even greater. It's wonderful, isn't it? To spend time with your grandkids and uh, to enjoy them so much and then to send them home when it's time for them to go. It's just wonderful, you know. But children are such a great blessing to all of us, and we need to understand how important that is to the Lord as well. So in this passage of Scripture, Mark chapter 10, beginning at verse 13, we have a, an account here of something that happened in the Lord's ministry. Verse 13 said, People were bringing little children to Jesus to have Him touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, He was indignant, and He said to them, Let the little children come to Me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these." I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, put his hands on them, and blessed them. And so, very, very interesting account here of, of what happened when Jesus is uh, going about his ministry. Now, this is getting close to the, to the end of his earthly ministry. He's about to go to the cross not, not long after this. And so, parents, uh, we're told here, are bringing their kids to the Lord. Now, it was a very common thing for uh, rabbis to bless the children. Parents would bring their, their children to the rabbi, to the preacher, and he would bless them and place his hands on them and, and ask the Lord to bless them. But also, by this time in the Lord's ministry, it's becoming very, very clear to a lot of folks that Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Lord. And so I think that's a whole other reason for taking your children to Jesus, because of the recognition of who he is. And parents wanted to do this. So this just kind of jumped out at me here from verse 13, that children need the Lord. Children really need the Lord. It says these people were bringing their, their children to Jesus to have Him touch them. But the disciples rebuked them. They say, well, what's that all about? Well, apparently the disciples decided that this was not important. That Jesus being a very, very important uh, you know, preacher and teacher and a Messiah that his earthly mission is so very, very important that this is for adults only, this is not for children, and this is something that they're interrupting. And they thought that these parents bringing their kids to Jesus was just interrupting him, and they know now that, that he's getting closer to the time where uh, you know, he's going to go to the cross and all of that. And, and they probably think, we don't have time for this, we can't make time for this, this is not important. And so they were telling these parents, no, you cannot bother him. You know, disciples who would follow a, a teacher or a rabbi, their master, they would go to great lengths to protect him and to guard his time and things like that. So I suspect that that's what they're trying to do. 
So they may have good intentions, but it's not what the Lord wanted them to do. And so anyway, these, these parents are bringing their children to the Lord. And that just really spoke to my heart about how important it is for us to, to bring children to the Lord in your area of influence, whatever that may be. Whether you have children of your own that are smaller, or you have grandchildren, or you have neighbor children. I see neighbor kids all around the area where I live, and I'm concerned about them. Many of them, I'm sure, don't attend church and do not know the Lord. And so I've got a burden about that. I want to do something to, to reach out to those folks and try and encourage them to, to come to the Lord, to know Jesus. And so children really need the Lord. And there are really two areas here I want to focus on this morning of responsibility when it comes to teaching kids about Jesus. And that first area of responsibility falls on the parents. The parents have an awesome responsibility to introduce the Lord Jesus Christ to their children and to raise their children in the admonition of the Lord, to teach them the Word of God, and to bring them to church on a regular basis. I can't think of anything more important uh, for a parent to do than to teach their children about the Lord. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, uh, Moses wrote about this. This is when the Israelites are about to inherit the, the promised land. They're about to go into the land. And Moses is giving them kind of a repeat of the law, kind of a summary of things. And this is what he says in verse 6. He says, These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. And he said, Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. In other words, all the time. Talk to your kids about the things of God. Understand the Bible. Study the Bible. Know the Bible. And impress those things upon your children because there's nothing more important than helping children to know the Lord and to come to, to Him and to grow as young believers. It's very, very important. And so parents have an awesome responsibility to do those things. And then there's another verse I want you to note with me in Ephesians. This is very important. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4, Paul addresses the fathers. He says, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, he says, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Now, why does the Holy Spirit of God inspire Paul to write to fathers specifically about this particular thing? Now, does that mean that mothers are not important? Well, of course not. We know mothers are very important. Why is it that fathers are called out here in this passage and called upon by the Lord to specifically teach their children the things of God. That's because fathers have the primary responsibility to do that in the home. That's why. And guys, if you've got kids or you've got grandkids, you have an awesome responsibility before the Lord to teach your children or your grandchildren the things of God and to do everything you can to lead the way so that they understand how important this is to them. That's your responsibility as a father. doesn't mean that mothers are unimportant. It doesn't mean that mothers don't have a vital role to play in the, in the home. Of course they do. Certainly they do. But mothers, of course, by God's design, tend to be more nurturing, whereas fathers tend to be more in a, a leadership area, right, where they lead the family. And so just like you are to lead your family, guys, and everything else, you are to lead your children to love the Lord and to know the Lord. God will hold you accountable for that. And so this is very, very important. You know, I like to watch these talk shows. I really get into these talk shows and... Uh, uh, I record uh, Dr. Phil on the DVR, you know, and I watch that when I get home from work. I don't always agree with him on everything, just so you know. But some things I do. But I've noticed on, on his talk show and many, many others, when they have these, these young kids, teenagers, usually they're in trouble. I mean, sometimes they've just twisted plum off, you know, and they're into to alcohol and drugs and rebellion, you know, and just talk back to their parents like you wouldn't believe. It's just unbelievable, you know some of the things that are going on in some of these families, so many times, so many times when they're on the platform there and they're discussing these things, the child is there, the mama is there, maybe even the grandmother is there, but many, many times there's no father. Now sometimes there is, but I've just noticed an inordinate number of times the father is not up there on the platform. And that tells me that he is not in that child's life at least not to the degree that he ought to be, because he's not even there. 
Well, there's part of your problem. That's at least part of it. May not, maybe not be all of it, but that's part of it, right? That father is not in that child's life the way that he should be. And so fathers have an incredible responsibility to lead their families, especially their children, to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, to set a good example for them, to model Christian values for them, to bring them to church on a regular basis so that they'll grow in the admonition of the Lord. Now that's incredibly important, isn't it? Very, very important. And so we need to understand that, that kids need the Lord and parents have an awesome responsibility you know, to do something about that. Now, a second responsibility, of course, beyond the parents and the home would be the church. Certainly the church has a big responsibility to teach children about the Lord, to share the gospel, and to help kids grow up in the Lord. Proverbs 22, verse 6 is a very familiar passage of Scripture. Train a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. Now, that can apply to the home, but also, I think, to the church. That's one of the things we do at church is train people in the things of God, especially children. That's why it's so important that we reach out to children, that we have ministries that help children grow in the Lord and understand the Scriptures and and you know, know about the Lord and, and understand how important it is to walk in His ways and to be obedient to Him. Very, very important that we do that. And so the church has a, a, an awesome responsibility to help with that. And it breaks my heart that many, many children are simply not in church as often as they should be. And I understand there are a lot of things for kids to do nowadays. I mean, there's all kinds of activities. I mean, I see it all the time. I walk around the park in the evenings. I see the kids out doing sporting events and stuff like that. And I know there are all kinds of clubs to be a part of, you know, and, you know, Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and all those things are fine. They're good organizations. Nothing takes the place of the church. Nothing. It's a, an awesome responsibility for parents to bring their kids to church as often as possible and to be there with them, to set an example for them about how important it is. Now, some parents just drop their kids off, you know, for church, and that's better than nothing, right? I mean, bad breath's better than no breath at all. It's better than nothing, you know. <laughs> the kids are there, and, and we get an opportunity to minister to them, but I'm going to tell you, it makes a big impact on a child's life when mom and dad are sitting there in the church, too. It makes a big statement to them. This is not just kid stuff, right? This is for everybody. This is for the whole family. And so that's important. Many children attend school. Some are homeschooled, which is fine. But whether it's in home or at school, how many hours a week do you suppose a child would spend in, in learning academic things? You know, think about it for a moment. You know, parents that, that take their kids to public school probably go, what, about 8 o'clock in the morning, pick them up about 3 o'clock. I know they have lunch and recess and things like that, but there's probably at least 30 hours a week in instruction. 30 to 35 hours a week at school, right? Monday through Friday? How many hours does a child spend at church in a given week? Maybe three or four at best. That's if you come to everything, right? Many children have less than an hour at church every week. Do doesn't it seem to you that we're kind of giving an impression of these kids that this is not that big a deal? They may spend more time doing something else, playing softball, than they do coming to church or something like that. I mean, we need to help our children understand how important this is. And I'm not saying you have to be here every time the doors are open. I mean, I wish you would, but if you can't, that's understandable. But we need to do a better job, moms and dads, especially dads, of bringing our kids to church and setting a good example. I grew up in a home where, where my dad didn't go to church. My mom took me all the time. She took my sister and me to church on a regular basis, to Sunday school and to worship. And we sat with her, and we heard the Word of God preached on a regular basis. Now, my dad, thank the Lord, got involved in church in the latter days of his life, but he didn't go when I was a kid. And so uh, that's regrettable. And I'm so thankful that my mom cared enough to bring us to church because she knew how important that was and is. And so I thank God for, for moms whose dads, you know, uh, fathers and dads are not there, and uh, husbands are not doing their job as they should. And I thank God for single parents that do such a wonderful job. Sometimes a single mom or dad has to carry both loads, and that's a tremendous burden. But God's plan is for a mom and dad to, to nurture their kids and be there with them, right? Bring them to church. And so that's very, very important. 
And so the church has this big responsibility. It's a foundational thing, you know. Most kids come to know the Lord. I should say most folks come to know the Lord as a child. Most kids make a decision before they reach adulthood. Now, not everybody. You can get saved at any age. But if you look at the statistics, most people become a Christian under the age of 18. Do you know that? Vast majority of people do. And, and there's a foundational thing that is built there as they continue to come to church and they learn and grow as a young Christian. There is a foundational thing to that that will stay with them for the rest of their lives. And so it's very, very important to build that foundation under them. And there's no substitute for that. Now, it can be overcome. God can help us overcome anything. But it's very important to have that foundation under those kids and for them to be involved in church uh, when they're young. Now, look how important this is to the Lord. Matthew 18, verse 10. Jesus here is talking about little children. And he says, see to it that you, you do not look down on one of these little ones. He's talking to folks about the importance of children. He said, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. What's that all about? Many, many scholars believe that he's talking about a guardian angel. Now some might dispute that. I tend to believe that's what he's saying. That there are angels in heaven that have been assigned to children that report to the Lord. If nothing else, it shows us how serious God is about children, right? And how important it is to him for them to be cared for and for them to be uh, you know, overseen. And so there are angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. You know, about 1900, about 117 years ago, there was a German postcard company that put out a, a postcard that had a painting of an angel watching over two children crossing over a rickety little bridge. You ever seen that? There have been different versions of that over the years. But this became very, very popular in our country, especially in the the eastern part of the country, in the Appalachian Mountain area especially. And because so many of those folks that lived in that area had a rickety old bridge, you know, that crossed over a creek somewhere. And so that really caught on in our country, and it became a very famous painting of an angel watching over these little children as they were crossing this dangerous rickety bridge. It comes from the same part of the country where the, the saying, you know, came, uh, if the good Lord's willing and the creek don't rise, that's where it came from, from that same area. They had lots of flooding and stuff like that at these creeks. And so that really struck home to a lot of people. And it became very, very famous that the Lord has an angel watching over these little children. And so certainly it's serious business with the Lord that we care for kids because kids need the Lord. Amen? They need the Lord. The second thing that, that spoke to me about this passage is that... Uh, Children certainly can enter the kingdom of God. You know, sometimes uh, we, we don't seem to appreciate that as much as we should. Uh, you know, becoming a Christian is, is open to everybody, especially to little children, because so many become Christians at a young age. And so children can enter the kingdom. And there comes a time in their life when they, they need to make that decision. In verse 14, it says, When Jesus saw this, that the disciples were preventing the the children from coming to him, says that he was indignant. And he said to them, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Now, Jesus was indignant. That's the Greek word agonokteo. Agonokteo implies incredibly deep emotion. It's a strong verb that means deep, deep passion and emotion. And so when Jesus got got indignant about this. I mean, he was really upset. He wasn't just annoyed. He was upset that these disciples were preventing these kids from coming to him so that he could bless them and perhaps teach them and pray for them. And so he really chastised his, his disciples about that. This is a very important thing. And so Jesus was very passionate about this. And there's three things that make a child accountable for salvation that I want to talk about this morning. Somewhere along the the road there. We came up with this phrase, age of accountability. I don't know where that came from. I don't really like it. There is no age of accountability. There's not a certain age that a child reaches, okay, you're accountable to the Lord. There, there is a, a moment of accountability. There is a time in every person's life when they become accountable to the Lord 
for their sin. And so that's what we're talking about. And, and unfortunately, we've come up with this term age of accountability, which really is kind of misleading. It's important to understand what makes a child accountable for salvation. This is especially important to, to parents. The first thing is that they must understand what sin is. A person has to have understanding about what sin is before they can have faith. Salvation is all about faith in the Lord. But before you can have faith in something, you have to have an understanding about it, right? And so a child must have a, a, an understanding about what sin is. It doesn't mean they have to be a Bible scholar or anything like that. But they have to have enough understanding in their mind to realize what sin is. Some kids are not there yet. And so that has to be present. A second thing is they have to realize their need for salvation. Realize that their sins, their personal sins, have separated them from a holy God and that they need salvation. And that apart from that salvation, that they'll be held accountable for their sins. And so they have to understand what sin is and then they have to have this realization of their need, their personal need to trust in Jesus as their personal Savior. And then there's one more thing that's very important. They have to have the conviction of the Holy Spirit. The conviction of the Holy Spirit urging them and encouraging them to make this decision to trust in Jesus. Now that can come at a different time for, for different people, right? And so 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, somewhere in there, only the Lord knows for each particular person, a child will become accountable for his or her sins. Now you tell me that's not an important time in that child's life. Something that we need to be very, very concerned about and something that we need to take great interest in. How can we help this child to come to know and understand their need for salvation? Because when the Holy Spirit convicts them of this decision that they need to make, that's when they become accountable for that sin. And if they go off into eternity after becoming accountable for that sin, then you know what's going to happen, right? They're not going to go to heaven. And so that's an awesome responsibility. And we need to be very sober about that and realize how important it is to help our children understand about what salvation is and help them to, to, to come to a point where they can make that decision as the Lord leads them to do so. Now, you know, we can't decide when that is. Only the Lord can do that. But we need to do everything we can to prepare the way, right? Do everything we can to prepare that child's heart so that when the time comes, they can make that decision to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so certainly children can enter the kingdom of God. In fact, that's usually when it, when it happens as a, as a child or a young person. And then thirdly, childlike faith is absolutely essential for salvation. Notice what Jesus said here in verse 15. He said, I tell you the truth, anyone who will receive the kingdom of God or will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. In other words, unless you come to the Lord as a little child with childlike faith, you can't even enter the kingdom of God. That's how important it is. So certainly children, you know, can respond to the Lord and, and be saved. Several things about this. Three distinctives of childlike faith. What is it about a child's faith that is so unique and special with regard to salvation? And this would apply to anyone, right? Whether you're an adult or a, or a young child. Well, first of all, to me, there's this anticipation and joy that accompanies a child's decision to trust in Jesus. You know, little kids, most of them anyway, smaller kids, don't have a whole lot of comprehension about what things cost, right? You know, they just want stuff, you know. And so they don't really think about, well, that's going to cost some money, and how much would that be? They just see something, I want that, you know, I'd like to have that, you know. You know, here a while back, you know, when the fidget spinners were so popular, you know. Everybody know what a fidget spinner is? Okay, if you don't, you need to go do some research on that. So it's a big deal, right? When those came out, man, I mean, everybody's buying these fidget spinners. And my grandkids got into that too, you know. So I shopped around. I'm going to find them one. And the uh, first one I got them broke. You know, it's plastic and it broke in no time. So I thought, well, this is no good. So I actually called around. I called around, you know, y'all have any of these fidget spinners, you know? And, and I found a place that had them. And so I went shopping, and I saw some that were metal, metal fidget spinners. And I thought, man, now that's what we need right there is a metal one, you know. And these came in a little case, wouldn't you know. It's really neat, you know. Just $15, $15, you know, for these things. 
And so I thought, well, I'm going to get a couple of those, you know, for my grandsons. And so one day I bought a couple of those. I got a black one and I got a gold one. And I picked the kids up on Thursday to go get a Coke and everything. And we spent some time together. And so I had those in my truck, you know, and I was talking to them. I said, well, you know, here a while back, you know, Jonathan got to pick out something. And, and today uh, we're going to let Jacob pick out something. And uh, I was trying to build up to it, you know, and everything. And I said, I got these things for you guys. And, and they're kind of special. and They're kind of unique. And, and uh, somehow Jacob, he just said, boy, if I could have a gold one. If I could have a gold one, that would be great, you know. Boy, I, boy, that really, my heart just lit up then, you know, because I had a gold one, you know. So I pulled this thing out of a console there, and you can see through this case, and there it was, a gold fidget spinner, you know. And Jacob, he's in the back seat of the truck, and he looks, his eyes got about this big around. He said, Jonathan, look, it's, it's in a case, it's in a case, you know. And boy, my old heart just, well, that makes you feel so good, you know. <laughs> boy, I struck gold here, you know. And so then I gave the black one to, to, to Jonathan. Now, they, they got about a dozen of those things now. It don't mean anything, you know. But at that moment, it was really something. I mean, it was really important, you know. And that's a kid for you, right? See, all they know is that they, they really want something. They have this anticipation when it's their birthday or something like that. They're going to get a special gift or a prize or something. And their eyes just light up and their hearts are just so excited and everything. And they have this joy and this excitement. I think that's part of what it means to become a Christian, right? You've got this anticipation, this joy, and this understanding that, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't cost you anything. You, don't, you can't pay for it. It costs Jesus something, but it doesn't cost you. You can't pay to be saved. It's a gift. It's a free gift that God is giving to you. And so I think that's a part of a childlike faith, you know, coming to faith in the Lord and and not, not having this comprehension, really, you know, that, that I have to pay for this or I have to earn something to get this, but it's a gift that is given to you that gives you this great joy and excitement and just thrills your heart. And so that's, that's what the Lord wants of us when we come to Him. He wants us to come in childlike faith with this anticipation and this joy about what we're receiving. The second thing about a child's faith is that kids believe without demanding a lot of proof, okay? Okay. Now, again, they have to have an understanding of what sin is. And they have to realize that they need salvation. But there's not this demand for tremendous proof. Show me. This, this, this. That's an adult thing, right? We kind of grow into that, don't we? We want all this, this analytical proof of things. But a child just believes. Just has childlike faith. Just believes. And that pleases the Lord. The Bible says it's impossible to please God without faith. We must have faith. And faith, like a little child, is a precious thing. To just believe without demanding all kinds of signs and wonders and proof and all of that, I believe that this is the way it is. And so that's the way the Lord wants us to be when we come to faith in Him. And then thirdly, humility and teachability is a part of a child's faith. Very humble, they realize that they're dependent upon their parents or whoever to provide for them and to guide them and to show them the way to go. And it's something that they, they cannot do for themselves. They're dependent on someone else. And so I think that's what the Lord is talking about here when he says, unless you become like a little child in your faith, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. You've got to be like a kid. You've got to be like a child in some ways. Now, isn't that special? Very important passage of Scripture. Children need the Lord. Children are entering the kingdom all the time. It's a very, very, very important time in a person's life and something that parents in the church need to really sit up and take notice about. And then we need to understand that we must have childlike faith in order to, to be saved in the first place, to enter the kingdom, to be a part of God's spiritual family. I want to ask you to bow your heads for a moment, please. Every head bowed and every eye closed. You got a a situation in your life right now where you've got some, some children, young children in your home. Would you just lift your hand for a moment, please? Just for a moment. Just lift your hand. You've got some young kids. Well, God bless you. This is one of the most important times in the life of your family to have these kids as a part of your home. And I just want to, I hope the Lord has, has helped you to see this morning and encourage you to understand how important it is to raise your children to know the Word of God. 
to set a good example for them of how important it is to attend church and to learn about him and to grow in their faith once they become a believer. If you got grandkids, young grandkids, you raise your hand for a moment. Amen. God bless you. Many of you have grandkids. I want to encourage you to do everything you can to be a positive influence in that child's life. Help them to understand how important your faith is to you because that's going to have a big impact on them. I promise you. They look up to you and they respect you and they love you. And if something is important to you, they're going to take note of that. It's going to be important to them. And many of us, all of us, I suspect, have kids in our lives. Whether it's your own child or a grandchild, you have neighbor kids, their relatives, there are others around you on a regular basis. You have opportunities every single day to influence a child in some way. And, and it's a unique opportunity that you have to make a tremendous difference in the lives of a child. And so I want to encourage you this morning to understand how important this is. We have an awesome responsibility as believers to reach out to children. Our church has a big, big responsibility to do that. Let's all work together to reach children for the Lord. Lord, I just want to thank you for the opportunity we've had this morning to gather and to worship in your house. Thank you for everyone that's come today, Lord. And Lord, we want to pray for kids this morning. Pray that you would help us to do a good job, Lord, to, to nurture them and to help them to learn the Word of God. Lord, I lift up our parents to you this morning. I know they have an awesome responsibility. And I know it's a difficult job. Sometimes it's very tiring. And sometimes difficult choices have to be made. So Lord, I just pray for our parents this morning that you would empower them and give them wisdom and guidance as they take care of these kids. Lord, help all of our grandparents and others as well to do the best we can to teach our children the things of God. Lord, if there's anyone that needs to make a decision this morning, whatever it may be, I just pray that you give them courage to step out and come and do so. Thank you, Lord, for this moment of decision. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand and sing.